was not much in their bags, even with what they had got from the trolls. I'm just going to put my phone on silent. If you are not new to the channel, you will know I always forget. And then it vibrates and throws everything off. Continue. One morning they forded a river at a wide shallow place full of the noise of stones and foam. The far bank was steep and slippery.
almost onto his hands and knees. It is long enough without watering it. My Bilbo doesn't eat all the cakes they call. He is too fat to get through keyholes yet. Hush, hush, good people. And good night, said Gandalf, who came last. Valleys have ears and some elves have over merry tongues. Good night. And so at last they all came to the last homely house and found its doors flung wide. Now it is is a strange thing, but things that are good to have, and days that are good to spend are soon told about, and not much to listen to, while things that are uncomfortable, palpitating, and even gruesome, may make a good tale, and take a deal of telling anyway. They stayed long in that house, fourteen days at least, and they found it hard to leave. Bilbo would gladly have stopped there forever and ever, even supposing a wish would have taken him right back to his hobbit hole without trouble. Yet there is little to tell about their stay. The master of the house was an elf friend, one of those people whose fathers come into the strange stories before the beginning of history, the wars of the evil goblins and the elves and the first men in the north. In those days of our tale, there were still some people who had both elves and heroes of the north for ancestors, and Elrond, the master of the house, was their chief. He was as noble and as fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves, and as kind as summer. He comes into many tales, but his part in the story of Bilbo's great adventure is only a small one. Though important, as you will see if we ever get to the end of it. His house was perfect whether you liked food or sleep or work or storytelling or singing or just sitting and thinking best or a pleasant mixture of them all. Evil things did not come into that valley. I wish I had time to tell you even a few of the tales or one or two of the songs that they heard in that house. All of them, the ponies as well, grew refreshed and strong in a few days though. Their clothes were mended as well as their bruises, their tempers and their hopes. Their bags were filled with food and provisions light to carry, but strong to bring them over the mountain passes. Their plans were improved with the best advice. So the time came to Midsummer Eve and they were to go on again with the early sun on Midsummer morning. Elrond knew all about runes of every kind. That day he looked at the swords they had brought from the troll's lair, and he said, These are not troll make. They are old swords, very old swords of the high elves of the west, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the goblin wars. They must have come from a dragon's horde or goblin plunder, for dragons and the goblins destroyed that city many ages ago. This the rune's name, or crest, the goblin cleaver in the ancient tongue of Gondolin, is a famous blade. This scandal was clamdering, for armor that the king of Gondolin once wore. Keep them well. Whence did the trolls get them, I wonder, said Thorin, looking at his sword with new interest. I could not say, said Elrond, but one may guess that your trolls had plundered other plunder or come on the remnants of old robberies in some hole in the mountains of old. I have heard that there are still forgotten treasures to be found in the deserted caverns of the mines of Moria since the dwarf and goblin war. Thorin pondered these words. I will keep this sword in honour, he said. May it soon cleave goblins once again. A wish that is likely to be granted soon enough in the mountains, said El. Now show me your map. He took it and gazed long at it, and he shook his head, for if he did not altogether approve of dwarves and their love of gold, he hated 
is this? He said. There are moon letters here, beside the plain ruins which, ruins which say five feet high at the door, and three may walk abreast. What are moon letters? Asked the hobbit, full of excitement. He loved maps, as I have told you before, and he also liked runes and letters and cunning handwriting, though when he wrote himself, it was a bit thin and spidery. Moon letters are rune letters, but you cannot see them, said Elrond. Not when you look straight at them. They can only be seen when the moon shines behind them. And what is more, with the more cunning sort, it must be a moon of the same shape and season as the day when they were written. The dwarves invented them and wrote them with silver pens, as your friends could tell you. These must have been written on a midsummer's eve in a crescent moon. What do they say? asked Gandalf and Thorin together. A bit vexed, perhaps, that even Elrond should have found this out first, though really there had not been a chance before, and there would not have been another until goodness knows when. Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks, read, read Elrond, and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. Durin, Durin, said Thorin. He was the father of the fathers of the eldest race of dwarves, the Longbeards, and my first ancestor. I am his heir. Then what is Durin's day? asked Elrond. The first day of the dwarves' new year, said Thorin, is as all should know the first day of the last moon of autumn on the threshold of winter. We still call it Durin's day when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky together. But this will not help us much, I fear, for it passes our skill in these days to guess when such a time will come again. That remains to be seen, said Gandalf. Is there any more writing? None to be seen by this moon, said Elrond, and he gave the map back to Thorin, and then they went down to the water to see the elves dance and sing about the midsummer's eve. The next morning was a midsummer's morning as fair and fresh as could be dreamt. Blue sky and never a cloud, and the sun dancing on the water. Now they rode away amid songs of farewell and good speed, with their hearts ready for more adventure, and with a knowledge of the road they must follow over the misty mountains to the land beyond. Now we're up to chapter four. I'm just going to stop and start the video so it doesn't time out. Chapter 4 Over Hill and Under Hill There were many paths that led up into those mountains, and many passes over them. But most of the paths were cheats and deceptions and led nowhere or to bad ends. And most of the passes were infested with by evil things and dreadful dangers. The dwarves and the hobbit helped by the wise advice of Elrond and the knowledge and memory of Gandalf, took the right road to the right path. Long days after they had climbed out of the valley and left the last homely house miles behind, they were still going up and up and up. It was a hard path and a dangerous path, a crooked way and a lonely and long. Now, far below, far, far away in the west, where things were blue and faint, Bilbo knew there lay his own country of safe and comfortable things, and his little hobbit hole, he shivered. It was getting bitter cold up here, and the wind came shrill among the rocks, boldest too at times, came galloping down the mountain sides, let loose by midday sun upon the snow, and passed among which was lucky, or over their heads, which was alarming. The nights were comfortless and chill, and they did not dare to sing or talk too loud, feeling the echoes were uncanny, and the silence seemed to dislike being broken, except by the noise of water, and the wail of wind, and the crack of stone. The summer is getting on down below, thought Bilbo, and haymaking is going on, picnics. They will be harvesting and blackberrying before we even begin to go down the other side at this rate. And the others were thinking equally gloomy thoughts, although when they had said goodbye to Elrond in the 
giants guffawing and shouting all over the mountainsides. This won't do at all, said Thorin, and we don't get blown off or drowned or stuck by lightning. We shall be picked up by some giant and kicked sky high through the football. Well, if you know anywhere better, take us there, said Gandalf, who was feeling very grumpy and was far from happy about the giants himself. The end of their argument was that they sent Philly and Killy to look for a better shelter. They had very sharp eyes, and being the youngest of the dwarves by some fifty years, they usually got these sort of jobs, when everybody could see that it was absolutely no use sending Bilbo. There is nothing like looking if you want to find something, or so foreign, Thorin said to the young dwarves. You certainly usually find something if you look. Is not always quite something you were after, so it proved on this occasion. Soon Philly and Killy came crawling back, holding on to the rocks in the wind. We have found a dry cave, they said, not far around the next corner, and the ponies and all could get inside. Have you thoroughly explored it? said the wizard, who knew the caves up in the mountains were seldom unoccupied. Yes, yes, they said, though everybody knew Good thing. 
like lightning in the cave, a smell like gunpowder, and several of them fell dead. The crack closed with a snap, and Bilbo and the dwarves were on the wrong side of it, where was Gandalf. Of that neither they nor the goblins had any idea, and the goblins did not wait to find out. They seized Bilbo and the dwarves and hurried them along. It was deep.
service, he replied. It was merely a polite nothing of the things which you suspect and imagine we had no idea at all. We sheltered from a storm in what seemed a convenient cave and unused. Nothing further from our thoughts than inconvenience in goblins in any way whatsoever. That was true enough. Um, said the great goblin, so you say. Might I ask what you were doing up in the mountains at all? And where you were coming from, and where you were going to. In fact, I should like to know all about you. Not that it will do you much good, Thorin Oakenshield. I know too much about your folk already. But let's add the truth, or I will prepare something particularly uncomfortable for you. We were on a journey to visit our relatives, our nephews and nieces, and first, second, and third cousins and the other descendants of our grandfathers who live on the east side of these truly hospitable mountains, said Thorin, not quite knowing what to say all at once in a moment, when obviously the exact truth would not do it all. He's a liar, a truly tremendous one, said one of the drivers. Several of our people were struck by lightning in the cave when we invited these creatures to come below, and they are as dead as stones. Also, he has not explained this. He held out the sword which Thorin had worn, the sword which came from the troll's lair. The great goblin gave a truly awful howl of rage when he looked at it, and all his soldiers gnashed their teeth, clashed their shields, and stamped. They knew the sword at once. It had killed hundreds of goblins in its time, when the fair owls of Gondolin hunted them in the hills, or did battle before their they had called it Orchrist, Goblin Cleaver, but the goblins called it simply Biter. They hated it, and hated worse anyone that carried it. Murderers and elf friends, the goblin. Great goblin shouted, slash them, beat them, bite them, gnash them, take them away to dark holes full of snakes, and never let them see the light again. He was in such a rage that he jumped off his seat and himself rushed at Thorin with his mouth open. Just at that moment, all the lights in the cavern went out, and the great fire went off, poof, into a tower of blue glowing smoke, right up to the roof that scattered piercing white sparks all among the goblins. The yells and yammering, croaking, croaking, gibbering and jabbering, howls, growls and curses, shrieking and scragging, that followed were beyond description. Several hundred wild cats and wolves being roasted slowly alive together would not have compared with them. The sparks were burning holes in the goblins, and the smoke that now fell from the roof made the air thick for even their eyes to see through. Soon they were falling over one another and rolling in heaps on the floor, biting and kicking and fighting as if they had all gone mad. Suddenly a sword flashed. In its own light, Bilbo saw it go right through the great goblin as he stood dumbfounded in the middle of his rage. He fell dead, and the goblin's soldiers fled before the sword shrieking into the darkness. The sword went back into its sheath. Follow me quick, said a voice fierce and quiet, and before Bilbo understood what had happened, 
was letting 